This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for making it out on a kind of a cold and rainy day. Um, also, lots of events happening on campus. So again, thank you for um, coming out this afternoon. My name is Ray Fouché. I'm the, um, I'm sorry, um, I'm, I've been under the weather a bit, but I'm, I'm feeling better. I'm the, the, um, the resident associate for the Center of Advanced Study under the theme Interpreting Technoscience. This theme and this initiative for this um, academic year has been um, really invested in thinking through the ways in which science and technology influence, affect, and shape the humanities, the arts, and the science and engineering. So it's a cross-campus interdisciplinary initiative to think about how we can understand science, technology, arts, and humanities in a more interactive and collaborative way. And under this idea, um, I'm very pleased to have with us today Pauline Oliveros. Pauline Oliveros' lecture today will be entitled Telematics, an expanded venue for the performance and for poor performance and education. I guess it's right above us, so I didn't need to read that. But um, <laughs> um, I guess this is what I, my job is to do. Um, so again, I, I'm very excited to have Pauline Oliveros here. Um, Pauline Oliveros is the Distinguished Research Professor of Music at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and currently the George A. Miller Endowment Professor at the University of Illinois. Pauline Oliveros' career as a composer, performer, and humanitarian places her among a select group of pioneers in American music. In 1961, Oliveros helped found and direct the San Francisco Tate Music Center, now the Center for Contemporary Music at Mills College. Her body of work traverses improvisation, electronic music, ritual teaching, and meditation to an innov innovatively forge new ground in the exploration of sound. She is most well known for her ecological combinations of accordion, electronics, and improvisation to develop deep listening, an environmentally thoughtful philosophy and practice that distinguishes the differences between the involuntary nature of hearing and the voluntary selective nature of listening. Pauline Oliveros has built a following through her concerts, readings, publications, musical comp comp compositions, as well as the extensive um, network of friends, family, um, and collaborators, and um, the, the, um, her workshops. She frequently exacts, acts as an advisor for various different um, national endowments, and um, as I've noticed throughout my day today, spending time with Pauline, um, the, her influence is far wide, broad, and deep. Um, I very rarely, when I mention someone who has had an interaction with Pauline Oliveros, says that hasn't profoundly influenced the way they see the, their, the world at the contemporary moment. And for scholars in the audience, um, she has published a series of books, um, Initiation Dream, Software for the People, The Roots of um, um, the Movement, and Moment, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking about all the revolutionary things going on, the roots of the movement, um, and deep listening, a composer's sound practice. Um, this afternoon, um, one of the things that was very interesting was that um, in talking about how people have tried to classify um, Pauline Oliveros' music, she said that most recently she has been referred to as a minimalist. Um, and um, I guess I probably she can speak more about that, but I prefer to think of Pauline as innovative, creative, and a pioneer. And it's with great pleasure I would like to introduce Pauline Oliveros. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here to, uh, at the University of Illinois again after a long hiatus and uh, to catch up with some of my old friends that are here. Um, and so I'm uh, uh, enjoying myself for the week, and I thank Jason Finkelman for his uh, uh, initiative in bringing me here and from, for 
Don, to Donna Cox and all of the others who have contributed to my uh, presence here, my residency. Um, it's been very, very dynamic and very enjoyable. So um, I, I, I have to uh, talk about this minimalist thing for a minute. Um, <laughs> Yeah, my uh, one of my longest, uh, longtime friends, uh, uh, whom I went to college with, was Terry Riley, and Terry has been uh, uh, named the kind of the father of minimalism. And of course, he doesn't fit the label either. Uh, these, <laughs> these labels, these categories, are difficult. Because Terry's music is very. Uh, very much uh, uh, ranges over a great deal of territory. And so when you are categorized into a very small space, uh, it doesn't feel really good. And so it's really better to just deal with the, the music. Deal with the music and see what, what it, it offers to you. So um, I want to begin my talk by saying that uh, I had been surfing the wave of technology now uh, in music for a good half century. And so I have a, a, a broad view of what has gone before and how uh, I was talking today about uh, with, uh, sorry, my, your name is slipping out of my mind. Huh? Ray. Ray, I was talking with Ray, sorry, excuse me. I was talking with Ray and we were talking excitedly about the changes in technology and how he, in his uh, uh, project in history, is really uh, enjoying uh, how, the, how the technology changes and how, to, how creative uh, people become using <clears throat> older technology and then using newer technology and using uh, uh, combinations of these technologies. And this has certainly been true for me and I, I have gone from uh, so-called analog uh, to digital in my half century. Um, but I never throw away anything, so I still have a uh, uh, deep connection with uh, all that's gone before. And a very uh, hopeful kind of connection with all that's coming in the future that I might be uh, uh, able to access. So let me give you a little talk here and show you some slides and play a few sounds. Um, so here we go. Telematics uh, generally refers to the interface of computers, communication, and performance. And this is a quote from Mark Dresser, who is a colleague at UC, UC, University of California, San Diego, and has gotten very, very involved in uh, uh, telematic connections and has written a really beautiful article that was appeared in all about jazz in 2008 and that was one of his one of the definitions that I picked up and thought was really uh, very nice and concise um, okay I got you oop I turned it off there there's oh, go back Okay, so the relatively uh, recent development of telematics is uh, initiating new performance and educational possibilities in a worldwide network for musicians, where even the internet, wherever the internet can be accessed. Um, traditional Western music inclu includes uh, co-located performers in, and uh, antiphonal compositions from very early on to the present day. Um, Renaissance composers, Gabrielli and Monteverdi, were inspired by the opposing choir lofts of the St. Marcos, Marcos Church in Venice. There we go. There it is. Um, and they uh, composed pieces exploring the spatial effects of performers at a distance from one another. Um, in wanting to use spatiality as a parameter of music, composers such as Stockhausen, uh, Zinakis, and Brandt have separated orchestras into smaller groups placed at a distance from one another to create 
uh, unusual effects. Uh, many composers use electronic means to establish a sense of unusual space and distance. So the internet as a new venue is inspiring composers and presents many opportunities for engaging in co-located performances in new educational situations. So this paper will discuss ways and means of accomplishing edifying performances with distant players, ways of broadening educational opportunities for students and faculties by collaborating with peers and colleagues in distant institutions. So maybe Rensselaer and uh, University of Illinois will be uh, involved in collaboration by next semester. Uh, low and high-tech telematic systems and their challenges for distributed performances, virtual residencies, and education will be explored here. Um, in one of my recent compositions, Urban Echo, Circle Told, for 60 voices and eight dancers, took place in the Rotunda, a space owned by the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. This huge form, former chapel had a resonant wooden floor, is domed, and has irregular acoustics and a large radius that provided distance between former performers. The chorus was choreographed to move as well as the dancers. They were instructed to play the space with their voices. Sound was directed to the floor, to the walls, and to the dome from many different configurations and antiphonies. A single choir formation projecting unidirectionally could not have accomplished the sounds that, uh, that were experienced in the rotunda. Now I'm going to See if I can make this switch so you can hear a little bit of that. Okay, now. GA. Did we? Okay. And we go here. And there are the, um, the dancers intermingled with the chorus in the rotunda. We will really hear a little bit of this. Okay, um, now I'm going to return to my oh, here. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> to continue, um, continue on, uh, this collaborati collaboration was accomplished through an in-person consultation between Leah Stein, the choreographer, and myself, the composer, um, 
after our consultation, we, we discovered that uh, we had uh, very similar uh, working methods and uh, that our, uh, our collaboration should turn out to be fairly com compatible. Uh, I left immediately after that consultation for a four-month residency in the south of France at the Camargo Foundation. And Stein agreed to keep a detailed journal of her rehearsals with Alan Harler in the Mendelssohn Club Choir. Stein would send me her journal entry and I would return it via email with comments and further instruction for the next rehearsal. Through this remote means, uh, the piece developed. On my return, I attended a rehearsal in person for the first time after uh, Stein had been working with the, with the chorus and the dancers for four months. And her excellent journaling made it seem as though I had, uh, had already been to the rehearsals. I was able to step right in and give input as though I had been there all the time. I attended one more rehearsal and dress rehearsals and Urban Echo Circle Told was performed four times uh, in Philadelphia and uh, was, was well received. And the, uh, uh, the singers uh, in this Mendelssohn choir are, have been used to the repertoire of classical music and Brahms Requiem and Mahler and so on. And uh, to participate in, in a, uh, a very unusual way was, uh, was certainly new to them and beyond the comfort zone of some. But they um, eventually uh, got into it and uh, really did a beautiful job. Uh, and so I was very pleased. But I was also, also pleased that, that uh, we'd, Leah Stein and myself developed a new way of working together in collaboration. And the journal is, um, we're now going to edit it and make it available for, for people who might want to embark on such a project, a kind of project like that. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. So now uh, we're going to move to um, Tentanabulate, which is a... Um, it's a Tentanabulate is an, a, um, an ensemble that I have created at, at the Rensselaer. And it <clears throat> has developed since 2005. It's an improvisation ensemble. And the uh, ensemble works in many different ways, but uh, they work in uh, uh, distributed performances. So uh, spatial location is essential in my work, whether acoustic or electronic. Transmission between locations via the internet is a new kind of antiphony. The space between the locations is represented by the internet and is a new antiphonal space. Um, in this clip, I'm going to play you um, um, of a, a distributed performance <clears throat> just so you can get uh, an idea here. This, this clip is, um, has four, four different locations. No. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so so you're, you're going to be, we're, you're, we're performing an, on stage at McGill University, the Tintinabulate Ensemble, uh, and then uh, there is there are performers coming in from RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and from um, Stanford University, Soundwire at Karma. And um, one of the members of Soundwire was in Seoul, Korea. So there were the, these four locations that were represented in this. So you can...
Okay, so um, the sounds that you were hearing were not all represented on the stage there. They were coming in, as I said, from as far away as Seoul, Korea, and uh, from Stanford, Palo Alto, and RPI. Um, the the uh, quality is, is CD quality audio uh, from a software that is called Jack Trip and was developed by Chris Chafe at uh, Stanford University. And this software uh, allows for, for multi-channel transmission of audio uh, with very low latency. Uh, the latency in this uh, software uh, is, is, is as short as 32 seconds, which is or milliseconds, um, which is not um, as bad as some concert halls. Uh, people are always concerned about uh, latency. And um, when, when you mention transmission over the internet, uh, but this software has, has made it possible for ensembles to play together uh, quite well. Okay. Um, since it's, uh, now we'll move on a bit here. Let's see. Um, telepresence. Um, it refers to being present at a, at a distance uh, through using uh, telematics, of course. You know. Um, and I have been teaching my uh, deep, uh, deep listening uh, class at Mills College from my home in Kingston, New York, uh, since 2001. Uh, so that <clears throat> this uh, relationship with Mills uh, College, where I had been teaching prior to my uh, uh, position at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, is maintained. Uh, I teach a two-hour course um, in the fall, uh, and here is, uh, is going to change here. There, here is a, uh, a look at telepresence. Being in uh, there, there I am at home, uh, and on I'm looking into the classroom and seeing myself as the students are seeing me. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> especially if you're narcissistic or something. <laughs> so so they're, they're, uh, they're speaking to me, and they, uh, there she is looking at the screen to, uh, to, to speak to me. Um, there are interesting sorts of, uh, of things to, to work with, work on with telepresence, um, because first of all, you have to, you have to get the, the students in a custom to the fact that the screen talks back, uh, and that it's not you're not just watching TV, but that you're actually uh, engaged with with a person who is uh, in the space with you, although at a distance. And uh, so there are very simple things like uh, looking directly at the camera, so that it appears uh, that you have eye contact. Uh, and not uh, simply ignoring the screen and uh, doing something else, um, but really being engaged with, with this, uh, this kind of presence. But <clears throat> I've had very uh, wonderful classes uh, in the time that I've been teaching at Mills this way. And uh, I have also interaction with graduate students there and um, uh, so that it's, it's almost as though I'm there. Very interesting. Just just as the email contact with uh, uh, Leah Stein and the collaboration worked in that way. So telepresence then means that I and my class are present to one another through telematics. Uh, we can see and hear one another. I've used a variety of low-tech te technologies to affect telepresence. Uh, in the beginning, I was using Yahoo Video Messenger, which was, you know, Pretty uh, difficult to, to maintain. But I coupled it with telephone conference call for the audio so I could uh, uh, have good sound and uh, also uh, see into the classroom. So there I am frustrated. Frustrations. Uh, I thought I'd talk about that a little bit. <laughs> Because uh, in, information technology is exacting, 
takes a lot of what I call head banging to make sure that all the protocols are in place. So in this case, there was an IP address that was out of place. But somebody may upgrade on the other side and not tell you. And so then you can't connect in, in the way you're used to connecting. There are, there are so many different uh, uh, ways for things to go wrong <laughs> that I had to show that slide. Because I've, I've looked like that many times. And it has been, it's a, it's a very difficult path, uh, of, or not a path, it's a, it's a uh, trailblazing uh, to, to do this work. And you keep wondering, you know, why do you do it when it, you know, makes you feel like that at times. But the rewards, I think, are there. So um, here I'm a visiting professor at uh, Wesleyan University. And uh, <laughs> you can see the, the gamelan in the World Music Hall there in back of my, my the, the TV. Uh, and... So this was a this was a very nice uh, class that I uh, uh, in that visit. Uh, so I wasn't so unhappy. <laughs> okay. So now I want to um, um, move to virtual worlds, um, Second Life, and um, there's over eight million ha inhabitants in Second Life now after about uh, maybe 10 years of existence. I went in there uh, early on before the platform had uh, developed and uh, uh, then uh, I had the opportunity to go back again. And so I have uh, an avatar, free noise, <laughs> free no yes. <laughs> or Free Noise, that's my name in Second Life. And there I am. <laughs> and uh, I have on a, uh, what is no, called in, in, the, uh, in that virtual world a, a receiver, this kind of uh, veil-like uh, uh, attachment to my avatar. And <clears throat> that receiver is, uh, uh, important in terms of making sound uh, in the piece that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, this is uh, free noise with uh, Dreambird Timeless, and we're floating in a gondola in uh, Second Life up in, up in the sky, and we're in an installation that was uh, created by Edo Paulus, a, a Dutch uh, sculptor. And the, there are 100 windmills in this installation, and you 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 uh, float around in the installation. And as there is a wind, a, sec, a virtual wind in Second Life, and the wind blows the windmills, and the windmills then make these uh, lovely tinkling sounds uh, that you experience as you uh, float through through the uh, through the installation. Uh, Dreambird Timeless, by the way, is Ione, uh, who is here with me today and uh, is the artistic director of the Deep Listening Institute, as well as many other things. Um, so uh, an, <clears throat> a very interesting opportunity came when I was invited uh, by the Avatar Orchestra Metaverse to uh, make a piece for them. Now. This, this orchestra um, has been in, in existence for a, a couple of years. Here is a, one view of some of the core members of the orchestra. Um, and there are composers and um, uh, uh, people who are interested in various ways. Uh, anybody can join the orchestra because it's possible for people without musical training to play the, um, what is called heads-up displays, HUDs. Uh, these HUDs are pro uh, uh, programmed by people who know how to script for Second Life, and uh, you can play them uh, in Second Life, so all the sound, which usually consists of samples and, and electronic sounds, can be heard inside of Second Life. 
um, and that was part of the Avatar Orchestra's uh, mission, was uh, to, to make pieces that were generated inside of the virtual world. Then they asked me to do a piece, um, and I agreed, and then I turned things upside down by uh, having sound piped in from trombone players and voices uh, to mix with the sounds in, in the uh, virtual world. And um, this is a, uh, a shot, a screenshot of the Heart of Tones where the avatars are floating in the air um, and uh, turning, flo floating and turning, and the sound uh, is uh, really quite amazing. It's, it, uh, it's a beating kind of sound where um, very close clusters of, of uh, tones um, uh, cause beats and flutters uh, while the uh, orchestra is floating around and, and playing their sounds, actually. So uh, it's, uh, this is a, uh, you know, kind of an interesting uh, uh, possibility within Second Life so that you can float around and play. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did a, um, a solo in Belfast, Ireland in Second Life where I was playing uh, the HUD uh, and I was using a single tone, but I was flying and there is Doppler shift in Second Life as well. So uh, as I flew, I could, I could make the tone slide in, in and out in very interesting uh, ways. Okay, um, now let's see, Heart of Tones, um, did that. Yeah, that's just there. There is just a location where uh, we were rehearsing one day. Uh, there, there, there are so many uh, amazing creative possibilities in to to work with in there. Um, so, per performance of uh, uh, in mixed realities was what began to get very interesting to me, so that you would have Second Life. Uh, avatars performing with real life people, uh, musicians on stage. Um, here is a poster which gives you uh, some views of, of a piece that we did at Northwestern University during the um, International Society for Improvised Music Conference in 2008, I think it was. and. Um, there was uh, participation from the University of Arizona and John Mitchell had uh, created dance avatars and these dance avatars uh, were uh, manipulated by dance students at, at, uh, at Arizona and they could do terrifically amazing things that uh, you can't be done in real life. Um, Iona and I were performing on stage at uh, Northwestern. I was playing my harmonica. Iona was doing spoken word uh, 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 improvisation. And uh, we had a, a, a dancer, a real life dancer with us, Eloise Gold, who is uh, in, in addition to being a uh, very creative dancer, she is also a Tai Chi master. And so she could move uh, extremely slowly. And so she moved uh, on the stage uh, in her beautiful way. And she was wearing a very tall hat, um, which uh, was like a, an inverted cone <laughs> on her head. And as she passed the screen with these avatars, they began to dance on her hat and, uh, and then across her body. So there are very different kinds of merging uh, of realities that can take place in this uh, kind of uh, a platform. So uh, <laughs> we have a group, a quartet, uh, which includes myself and I own, and uh, John D.S. Adams and Norman Adams, they're two brothers in Canada. And uh, we call ourselves the Extreme High-Risk Entertainment System, uh, the acronym ARIS, 
because we are interconnected, uh, all four of us, uh, in, a, in a giant kind of feedback loop, which is, of course, very dangerous. But it <clears throat> means that sometimes none of us know who is playing what. And that's fun. <laughs> so here is um, this uh, performance in Mixed Realities where um, we were in at Lincoln Center. If you can see the uh, video screen that's in Second Life. And uh, from, from Lincoln Center, uh, we were doing a uh, performance there, the Extreme High Risk Entertainment System. Um, and we were also doing a, uh, uh, a piece called the Worldwide Tuning Meditation, which um, meant that we had 11 radio stations, inter internet radio stations, um, coming in, each on one of 11 com computers that were on a table there at Lincoln Center. Uh, the audience was invited to do the tuning meditation, and um, the, the different locations, uh, which were in different parts of the world and also different parts of the United States, were, there were groups that were also doing the tuning meditation. They were listening to the people at Lincoln Center, and the Lincoln Center people were listening to them so that they were uh, doing this uh, meditation together uh, over distance. So this was one of the more uh, far-fetched uh, antiphonies that I have arranged. Um, you see um, an, a single avatar. Uh, this is Josephine Dorado, who was watching uh, our performance at Lincoln Center. And then she got inspired and started dancing in Second Life. And also, other, other avatars could come and watch this if they wanted to. And so there she is. Um, and so that's the uh, end of that particular section. Musicians are the harbingers of world community and planetary consciousness through music. There's no need for musicians to speak the same language. They can play together without speaking in real and virtual worlds. They only need to listen to one another, giving and receiving sound. Their encounters with different styles are negotiations and reconciliations of differences, another kind of antiphony. A world music genre has come about through many combinations of musical cultures and improvisation. This music moves through popular, classical, and experimental styles and ideas. Our time is an exciting time where musicians can meet and improvise in person, locally and through world travels, and also in virtual space on the internet. Virtual venues have been with us since the advent over 100 years ago of recording. Recording and radio broadcast made it possible to hear music from distant environments and cultures, making it even more compelling eventually to visit in person, to improvise and perform together for mutual musical cultural handshakes. The acceleration of technological development is producing more instantaneous musical encounters in telematic venues for high quality performances with distant partners. These telematic transmissions can promote reflexive friendships and enlarge the possibilities for world music and for world community. Okay. So if there are any questions, I'm ready. Let me go back to that comment you made about latency. It seems to me when I think of antiphonal music, it is very important to have a large latency, a great distance between them, and this is sort of what gave the early composers the power and emotion of their work. Mm -hmm. And you seem to be trying to minimize it. Wouldn't it be interesting to add delays into the uh, <laughs> automatic delays and unautomatic and changing <laughs> delays into the... 
Yeah. Broadcasting and receiving. Yeah. I always uh, address that question of latency because people are so anxious about it. But uh, for me, for me, I'm I am uh, convinced that we're all made of time delays. And uh, I say this because uh, uh, there was there's a nice uh, there's an interesting experiment uh, done by Benjamin Libay uh, some years back now um, where he he identified a ready, readiness potential in the brain, uh, and then uh, a decision um, action, and that there was a, at least a half second delay between our readiness to do something and our decision to do it. So the brain knows it in advance, and we only get wind of it a half second later. <laughs> <laughs> and then <clears throat> there's more study going on with this, and it's very exciting information. But um, uh, our consciousness is behind uh, a certain kind of awareness that the body has. Um, well, I have been working with delay uh, in my music uh, for 50 years. And I have worked uh, with as much as an eight second delay uh, when, when I was playing in, with an ensemble uh, from California and playing with an ensemble in New York and in uh, Boston, uh, co-located internet performance, when you couldn't uh, get by without an eight second delay. And I found it really exciting. I loved it. I loved to, to play like that. I play <clears throat> with my expanded instrument system, I call it, and when I play, in this concert that I did on Friday night, um, I was playing, uh, and it goes into my system, is recorded, uh, and played back uh, at different, uh, di different delay times. I have up to f 40 different delays in my uh, delay processing system. So I can have the maximum of 40, and, and I can minimize it to one. But... <clears throat> When I play a sound, I know it's going to come back in the future. And then when it does come back, um, I, it's part of the past. And so that means that I have a, an expanded time sense that's going on that is made up of all of these delays. And so, yes, sure. Why not have large distance and long delay? I like it. <laughs> to answer your question. I was struck by your uh, love of Antiphony and how you've worked it uh, through your uh, music and your historical understanding of it. I want to know what about Antiphony is so moving to you that you've made it such a central part of your practice and especially the possibility of using it to make an immersive experience for audiences and maybe a participatory experience for audiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, I mean, it's always been a fascination of mine to listen since I was a, a child. And um, I'm certainly interested in echoes. I think most people uh, are generally interested in when they hear a, a long echo. It's, it's very uh, exciting to hear, hear your voice come back. Uh, and I remember going uh, to the Joshua Tree National Monument out in the desert in, in uh, California. And there was a place where you, one could stand and shout and hear seven different echoes come back. So um, I think it's just a, a natural phenomena that we, we, we perceive, we hear. And if you think about, uh, say, the music of Bach, uh, think about the Bach inventions, for example, or the fugues. But you hear a um, uh, you know you hear a, a subject stated, and then you hear it echoed. You know? And so I think echo is plays a really uh, deep role in in traditional music uh, of many kinds, as well as my own. But I've just taken it to some uh, to another level now. Uh, with the with the work that I've done in this last, uh, I guess the expanded instrument system is about thirty to thirty five years of development yeah, now, 
and we're still working on it because it keeps changing, keeps evolving into uh, you know new levels of, of understanding about how to use it. So, and there, <clears throat> the long delays, which are very interesting, uh, because you have time to recognize them. But then there are the very tiny delays. I mean, that, that in our within our body, in our bodily system, uh, uh, nanosecond delays or picosecond delays, they're there, and it's happening all the time. But we're just not uh, we we are not listening to those because they're not. Uh, available to us with the the, uh, the way we we hear. So. I don't know if I answered you or not. Did I answer you? <laughs> you went another direction, but I love it. Okay. <laughs> Very non-musical and uh, very sort of pragmatic, but I picked up to play uh, on WFT one of your uh, CDs, and it said, no more, and you've asked us to dream, and I'm an ecologist, so I'm dreaming of using this particular medium to change the neatness uh, of the society that mows uh, countless millions of acres of ground and uses the energy to do that. And I'm thinking of you coming to the Midwest and, and looking at all those tractors and, and <laughs> mowers and, and, <laughs> and that's, it's probably totally away from what you're no mow because you don't have a W on the end of a, a, a <laughs> mow. So I was wanted to know what, where did you get that title and a little bit about the... Where, where did I get the title? No more. Yes. No more. Yes. Oh, because uh, it was, the piece was made out of noise, and uh, I was using a process called modulation to make the piece, so I no just more. shortened yes. it to no more. Okay. I was just curious. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering if you had any thoughts or feelings, actually, about the emotional content um, in a virtual interaction. If we're in the same space, I don't know if we feel, you know, a certain human vibe and mm -hmm. how you have experienced sort of human emotion over the internet. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a really great question. Um, I notice that I'm, I, I'm uh, getting more and more emotional about my avatar. <laughs> what happens to her? <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, it's it, because you're animating a, a being, a virtual being, you know, with, uh, uh, with how you control the movements and, and uh, Things I think I partic got particularly excited when I started. I was really flying around with the Doppler ship, and uh, I got really excited. I, <laughs> there's um, and uh, there's a, a beautiful con kind of community in this uh, Avatar Orchestra metaverse. And I recommend you, if you're a second lifer, to come and visit and maybe join the orchestra. It's, it's a lot of fun. People really take care of one another in the community. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'll just tell this story. Um, when, when, I, uh, when we were going to do the premiere of the Heart of Tones, one of the trombone players who, who was uh, playing in the Avatar Orchestra for this and was piping his, his real trombone sound into the mix um, was I suddenly had a heart attack and died, and he. Uh, so I had involved a, a friend, uh, another friend, to come in and take his place, and there was a very amazing synchronicity that happened. And they had been friends, 
uh, also. But um, uh, Toyoji had an avatar which was a little animal with a like a like a raccoon or a fox, and um, that's what he used as his avatar. And he had a he had gotten a little trombone to use in in Second Life as well, and. <clears throat> So uh, when Stuart went into Second Life, he was very inexperienced. He'd never been in there before. And he was only doing it for me and for Toyoji because he knew the importance of uh, the memorial we were going to do for him in Second Life. And so he went in and he chose an avatar. And I met him <coughs> at, a, at a, a, a location. It's called a sim, a simulation. I met him there. And lo and behold, he has selected the same avatar as Toyoshi had, but he had no idea that that was, was, was it. It was just a synchronous thing. And there he was, looking just like Toyoji in there. Um, it was very uh, kind of moving, you know, you, to, to the experience that. And then uh, we did a memorial for Toyoji of playing the Heart of Tones. and. Uh, so there was a great deal of uh, emotional energy that accumulated around that experience. Um, and then later, there was a, uh, a uh, memorial which I organized at Mills College for Toyoji in, in real life. Um, so th these things connect uh, in, in uh, interesting ways, and I can I can't really, um, I, I think, I think it, that one has to experience it um, to get the feeling. You know. But I certainly have uh, a feeling, a feeling tone that happens uh, in, in participating in these various uh, pieces and, and actions uh, in Second Life with, with the orchestra, yes. I wondered if you would talk a little bit about improvisation as an observed performance medium as opposed to a participatory medium. Not that they are exclusive, but just what is, what is this to observe improvisation as an audience member and how do you think about that in, in your works? So, well, if I'm <clears throat> an audience member and I go to a, a concert and uh, it's improvised, I, I just I'll uh, listen to it and, and want it to be excellent and wonderful and moving and give me uh, any, a good experience. I mean, it's really no different than if I went to a, uh, a classical concert or a world music concert or jazz concert, any other kind of concert. Um, I don't. I mean, I like and love uh, a range of all music. Uh, and improvisation certainly is one uh, part of that uh, continuum that I enjoy. Um, I think that uh, uh, if an improvisation takes me somewhere that I haven't been before, then I'm really excited. You know? And once in a while that happens. And it's generally, it's, it feels to me as though uh, improvisation is, um, or improvised music by, uh, is, is among the most exciting. Now, <clears throat> I'll say this. Um, I use improvisation in my teaching, and I also use it uh, in a project which is called Adaptive Used Music instruments for the physically challenged. And I <clears throat> chose to work with three children who could, the, the only voluntary movement they have is just a little bit of turning of the head. Um, they're confined to wheelchairs and they can't speak. So with uh, the help of a team at RPI and the Deep Listening Institute, we developed the software which enabled these children to uh, play drum sounds uh, by simply moving their heads uh, with a camera tracking the, the movement. 
and uh, they could see their own image in the computer screen uh, with a mark on, on the tip of the, of the virtual nose on the screen. And there was a line, uh, a couple of lines, so you could move, uh, move your head and, and get different sounds. And so I think one of the most exciting and emotional experiences that I've had in the, in the last couple of years is when one of those children began to improvise drum patterns and, being, and was enabled to play in, in a drum class, which is all improvised. <laughs> so uh, this is not something you'd hear in a concert somewhere, but it was something that was happening uh, in a uh, very special time and, and environment. It was very, very exciting because of the great potential for opening up a world there. Now, what else was you, did you ask me or did I go somewhere else on that one? I think you got most of it, but what I'm, I guess I'm trying to get at is, as improvising performers, how, do, how does one include an observing audience? Oh, An audience oh, that is okay. not... Well, I'll, t I'll tell you how I do it, because I can't speak for anybody else. Um, but how I do it is that I'm listening to the audience. I'm, I'm listening to everything. I'm listening to this audience now. And I hear it. I mean, I'm perceiving the presence of all the people that are here. Um, and that's a, I consider that to be a part of my improvisation, because I'm improvising now. You know, I don't know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> but I'm listening, and I'm listening for uh, the response, and I'm listening for whether or not my words are going anywhere. And I do this in a, when I'm making my music. I'm listening to everything. Because everything that there is in the environment is influencing me or impacting on me as I am impacting on others. And so there is a, uh, what gets set up is a, a feedback uh, loop between me and the audience, and the audience and me. Uh, if I'm listening and if I'm acknowledging everyone uh, in, and their presence in in the in the performance, then uh, something very uh, interesting happens. I mean, there's an atmosphere that's created. Um, as we talked about before, I'm, I'm really interested in the evolution of technology and music. So um, I'm I would ask you kind of this humongous question, but um, what do you currently see as the, the limitations, the tensions, and the opportunities from, from a technological, conceptual, spatial, and acoustic perspective in um, virtual performance and performance at a distance? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I, I kind of showed that in the middle of my talk with the frustration picture. <laughs> There's a great tension there. And <clears throat> if you're at all interested in, in uh, going into doing uh, virtual performance or, or performance at a distance or using virtual technologies, then the first thing you have to do is take the system administrator out for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. You've got to get really well acquainted with whoever the system administrator is because they can close down the bandwidth on you and cause all kinds of packet loss and everything else. <laughs> when, when I'm teaching at Mills, um, Mills has uh, you know, very limited bandwidth and it, uh, it's very difficult to do what I do there. And so the system administrator is, is uh, now cooperating. And <clears throat> every Monday when, uh, from 10 to 12 at Mills, the, that portal is open. You see. But that, that's, uh, that's one of the essential uh, tensions, and it's more political than it is technical. <laughs> and, um, so, I mean, you can learn all sorts of technical things, but if you don't have the... Uh, the political uh, arena covered, 
you may have a lot of tension. So, but technically, I mean, the, the, there are all sorts of things that can be done now that uh, even a year ago were not possible, I think. But uh, it, it's, uh, the other thing is communication, good communication with, with everyone who is concerned with the, um, uh, you know, the delivery, I mean, of, of making of the results. You have to have everyone uh, working together as a team. And <clears throat> that's not always easy when, say, the system administrator is in some building way over somewhere, you would never see them, you don't know. And you don't know what their problems are or what their concerns are. And they don't know what yours are. You know, and maybe <clears throat> I've had the situation where the assistant administrator went home for the night and <laughs> forget about it. Um, so it's, it, it comes down to you know, people relating well to one another. <laughs> and one final question about that is, so how is it influenced um, and changed the way you listen and hear? Hmm. Well, uh, any, uh, any medium uh, presents you with you know, di different, uh, different possibilities. And um, uh, to, to establish a virtual world in a real world, uh, you have to have uh, a very good um, you have to have a very good sound system, and you have to have it deployed in such a way that it, it doesn't cause confusion about where sound is coming from. There's a lot of design factors, and this is a, another tension because, uh, generally speaking, uh, people are just used to sitting, you know, putting up a couple of speakers and then turning something on or playing, whatever. But there's not any real design in terms of the space and in terms of where the, where the sound is coming from. And so if you had a real ensemble and then you have a virtual ensemble, you have to make it possible for people to, the audience, to distinguish, and also the players, to distinguish which, where the sound is coming from and how they can perceive it uh, in a dimensional way. And I think that's, a, uh, that's not an easy problem. It's very... Uh, uh, needs a lot of work and a lot of design and uh, a lot of know-how. So you, you really need good audio people and good video people. I mean, to deal with the virtual space is another uh, very, very creative arena. You know, how to, how to create a virtual space that, that uh, couples correctly or couples appropriately or creatively with a real space. How do you do that? Not with just a window. You know, but uh, something that's more Im immersive or more uh, uh, has more possibility of fading into the ambience of, of the whole situation, I think. And it's not, you know, it's not there yet, not at all. But it's it's a wonderful arena for people to tackle, I think. <clears throat> if uh, you were vice chancellor for improvisation at the University of Illinois, it's a very um, specialized university, and it's been very hard for students to move across disciplines. It used to be very hard for, to move across three disciplines, let alone 20 disciplines. And if you were in charge of not just music and art and all these things that you're involved in, how have you some suggestions to us as to how we encourage students to get into this? There's been 30 slots open for people to write their own programs, for instance, as undergraduate people, mm -hmm. but a PhD doesn't get to do that. Mm. Uh, uh, so how would you as Vice Chancellor for Improvisation uh, <laughs> uh, uh, activate this university to do some more broad <laughs> interdisciplinary things, not only in one discipline, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, you have to get people together who are interested in, in uh, working Yes, there together. are some wonderful little parts happening, and they're Absolutely. being allowed to happen in art and music and, right. and other places. I, I, I think that's good. We have to generate those. Yes, right. I mean, we have to... <clears throat> 
uh, at Rensselaer Polytechnic, where I teach, we have a program which is called Integrated Electronic Arts at Rensselaer. So that uh, acronym is IEAR, which uh, we have that uh, IEAR in the uh, title of, of the acronym, IEAR, I and EAR, okay. And <clears throat> uh, this, this program started 20 years ago when, when uh, and, and the uh, uh, real interest at that time was combining uh, sound and image uh, with audio and video and maybe having a, you know, some kind of a setup which, with speakers and, and, vi and a video screen. But uh, the program today, that as it has evolved, is much broader than that. And uh, as a matter of fact, we're, we're having a conversation now about changing the name and not losing the acronym to um, Integrated Experimental Arts at Rensselaer. Um, simply because our students are not necessarily uh, electronic artists. They come in, we have uh, our, our students uh, are artists and they've come to this, this program because they want to learn the technologies that will help them to do their art. But it's not necessarily, they're not necessarily electronic artists. That's very interesting. There's a, a tension there that, that uh, Ray would appreciate, I'm do sure. We, do, do we sometimes have to send people to smaller community colleges or, or not necessarily community colleges, but uh, liberal arts colleges or, or College where they have the capacity to move in yeah. this direction. Well, uh, one thing that I can m mention in my history is that um, when I came out of uh, the graduate program that I was in uh, and into the to the arena of San Francisco, uh, I I joined forces with others who were interested in making electronic music. There was no place to make it. There were no studios, there was none, nothing that would support it, uh, young composers that uh, wanted to, to do this kind of work. So we created our own space, and it, bec uh, it was called the San Francisco Tape Music Center. And uh, there we began to pool all of our um, resources to be able to make the kind of music that we wanted to make and to present it. Uh, to produce and present, uh, to bring in visitors, to do this. We built this all up out of uh, just desire to be able to do these things. And uh, so I think it takes uh, a passion and commitment from, uh, uh, you know, as, as few as two or three people to bring something together to start their, the spark and the scene that they want to have. Um, and have it happen. Uh, but it may not necessarily be in the university, it may be outside of it. You know? And then, as a matter of fact, as in the three, three years of the existence of the, uh, of the formalized San Francisco Tape Music Center from 1963 to 66, uh, it was then moved, it, 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 it suddenly attracted uh, very large funding from Rockefeller. Four hundred thousand dollars or something, and of course they didn't want to give it to to these artists. They wanted to give it to somebody that could be fiscal fiscally responsible. So <coughs> there you go. And so the San Francisco Tape Music Center was moved to Mills College, where that um, it still exists there as the Center for Contemporary Music, and uh, you know hundreds of composers have gone through there and uh, have used that. Uh, okay. One more? Okay. I hope I can make a clear question out of this, but my own experience of your access to the work that I've had of yours has given me a really profound relationship to place through this practice of listening and um, a sense of connection between things. And I have this odd resistance that I've been working really hard on to the virtual world mm -hmm. as a place that um, can often seem, I don't know, um, 
that the, those wider connections in our world are made invisible, or it certainly Im implies this cr very creative and imaginative space. But there's something about how you hold in your work this kind of deeply embodied understanding of connections between things that can move into a virtual space right. and still hold this sense of place. And I don't really know if I'm asking a question, but I have some kind of resistance to that, that, that technology is replacing the real, which I think is quite kind of reactionary in a way. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to your own experience of that in some yeah, way. Or right. Well, I mean, we, we all uh, always have resistance to change or the, these kind of changes. And uh, just think about it, how long it took the telephone to be adopted. 25 years before people would, you know, really get behind the telephone. <laughs> and uh, so, so when changes come along, uh, uh, people want to hang on to the way they do things, you know. So I don't want to, I mean, I remember uh, in, I started using email about 1980, 1983, I think. And uh, I was thinking, oh, goody, now I can communicate with my friends. I was in the West Co uh, New York East Coast, and I wanted to be in touch with my colleagues in California. So I had a few people that I could connect with, and, uh, but then I discovered that uh, I'd ask people if they had an email account. They said, oh, I don't know. Then they'd say, well, I have a modem, but I haven't hooked it up yet. <laughs> uh, then one of my friends, um, who was a completely logical person to have email, was very reactionary. I don't need that. Yeah, you go to the post office. And, oh. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, took, it took a long time. It took a while to, for email to be adopted. It took, uh, and I, there were so many things that I wanted to do with it in, in terms of community. And I couldn't do it because there was no cooperation out there. See? So every time some new technology comes along, I mean, the thing is, is the technology itself is not bad or good either way, but it's how it's used is the important thing. So if it's, if it's used well to improve the quality of life, of, to, to make creative space, well, then I'm all for it. I, I want to use it. And uh, so I, I, I look these, uh, upon these things as, as tools that I'm, I may or may not uh, use, but, but that, as I say, I don't think they're good or bad. A hammer is not good or bad, but it can use for, be used very badly, for example. But we need hammers. <laughs> And then, of course, we need nails, too. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so very much. Thank you.